Welcome to this brief lecture on the sociology of culture, on culture, cognition, and recollection. Last week we looked specifically at the cultural diamond and works of art. Thus we looked at material artifacts. However, the distinction between material and non-material culture is slippery. All culture reaches us through the senses, through an artifact or text. Thus, when we interpret these artifacts, we are looking beyond the surface to the level of meaning, the thought, feeling, or idea behind it. Right now we're focusing on thought, thinking, the cognitive fields in which creation occurs. In earlier historical periods, especially with the macro-sociological paradigms, the underlying assumption is that history is moving forward toward a goal. Some even assume that progress toward that goal or development is inevitable. Marxism is only one example. This makes empirical observations a bit problematic, and especially at the intersection of memory, time, and cognition. It is the latter, the cognitive component, I would argue, that most defines human culture. Human, humans can, to a certain extent, pause, create and navigate their own narrative within the constraints of existing or often competing larger narratives. This takes place at the intersection of memory, time, and cognition. How do individuals and groups tell their stories within a framework of competing narratives? How do individual stories fit into existing and emergent cultural fields and normative frameworks? How do individual stories connect to collective memories? What is the role of mass media and digital communication? John Hall introduces a working definition of culture which includes ideas and knowledge, humanly fabricated tools, and products of social action. It's too early to do any more than mention Anne Swidler's idea of culture as a toolkit, but hers is a useful theoretical idea and one that makes intuitive sense. Generally in sociology, we distinguish between structure and culture or society and culture. One problem in connecting or linking culture to society is that society is such a vague term. But here we mean social actors and their relationships. Culture, by contrast, refers to the beliefs, values, norms, and symbols or artifacts that reflect these. Social structure is a term not unlike society, but here it specifically refers to formal roles, relationships, and positions, often hierarchical. Earlier theorists, such as Herbert Gans, wanted to connect structure, but especially social class, to culture, which he did with his concepts of taste publics joined to high and low cultural forms. As we move forward, we will come to see these as cultural fields with embedded social actors and social mindscapes or time maps that draw individuals together into meaningful groups. Zerubbabel's mindscapes transcend subjectivity, but they refer to socially constructed clouds of inner subjectivity which are impersonal, but not universal. So the image on the right is deceptive. It looks like everyone is hardwired into a mindscape. Again, the pause of a human thinking community is needed to understand the idea. Not all professors of sociology or teachers agree with Weber's understanding of value-free sociology. However, his message in Science as a Vocation dovetails with our opening emphasis on cognition. For Weber, science and scientific inquiry form a significant part of the intellectualization and rationalization processes characteristic of the West. The instructor or teacher for Weber has a very special responsibility to teach sociology as a science meaning teaching in a value-free way. Being a teacher is not the same thing as being a leader. Weber was especially concerned that the differences in power between students and professors create a situation where students must listen, noting the checks on criticism that are not present in audiences in the external world. 
The tools of Web 2 have partially eliminated the one-to-many character of lectures and professorial roles. But what's most important in our theme this week is the pause created by thinking, and especially thinking within groups, a pause also noted by Weber. Aviator Zorobopel uses the term social mindscapes to talk about cognitive cultures and the social nature of thinking, a crucial component of cultural creation and reception. Mindscapes transcend individual subjectivity. The term refers to a socially constructed intersubjectivity or specifically human character. Mindscapes are impersonal but not universal. They are thought communities. We once held in high regard the isolated and autonomous thinker who develops his original genius from the old blank slate, cognitive individualism. This stands in contrast to the idea of innate faculties that precede experience and condition our reception, reminiscent perhaps of the ancient understanding of universal forms that govern all human thinking or cognitive universalism. The idea of a universal substratum has facilitated the rise of cognitive science just as it did the medieval science of universal forms. Based as the latter is, or the former is, on the premise of a shared biological template. Yet neither of these two extremes captures what we know to be true in our observations. Watching a video of neural stimulation or brain activity doesn't tell us what a Beethoven symphony sounds like or how it differs from hip hop. We know that thinking is social, that schools or groups develop, and their products have shared characteristics. Cognitive sociology integrates three levels the individuals, social beings, and human beings. Mindscapes thus offer an intermediate and integrative perspective. There are three levels with specific characteristics, cognitive individualism, cognitive sociology, and cognitive universalism. Cognitive individualism focuses on that subjectivity or thinking as individuals personal idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic ways of approaching things. Cognitive universalism is thinking as human beings, a natural or logical inevitability with universal cognitive commonalities. Cognitive sociology is in the middle, thinking as members of thought communities, focusing on intersubjectivity, conventional cognitive traditions, cultural, historical, and subcultural cognitive differences. Time maps adds another dimension to our thinking about cognition and culture, the social structure of, me of memory, how communities, and not just individuals, remember. Recollections are not always objective, and not everyone remembers the same way. The differences come to the forefront in public forums, especially forums planning for commemorations or museums. How, whose story is going to be told? Collective memory often takes place in stages over time as groups begin to connect personal narratives. This results in the creation of events that bring people together to commemorate or celebrate. And in many cases, this results in a monument, a work of art with, with its own aesthetic debates. Many of these start with these personal shrines, personal memorials, uh, personal gatherings, and then move forward into more collective groups. There are now a number of empirical studies of these commemorations in the commemoration process, studies of the Holocaust, Vietnam, the Vietnam Memorial, and 9-11. And many of these studies examine the role of media in shaping the emerging thought and or the commemorative communities. During the first five weeks of this course, you'll be working toward the completion of an essay on the creative self, a very important corner of the cultural diamond. You should have this essay in mind as we read through and discuss the assigned materials. 
As you work toward completion of your essay, you should also be thinking about the creation of a digital identity. How do you want to tell your story and represent yourself in cyberspace? That is, how do you want to tell your story about the integration of your academic learning with your experiential learning and your goals or your academic goals for the future?